Well, it's so good to be in worship with you today, and we're so honored to be able to partner with people like Elise West. People have been so obedient to God's calling, and we believe that through your generosity, we can meet this $60,000 goal and even exceed it, and we just want you to know that if and when that does happen, anything beyond that amount will be going to people all over the world. People like Elise West, who are Serve the World partners, just doing incredible things. And so we just thank you for being involved and being generous in this way. Hey, do you remember what it was like, the, the feeling that you had of driving your very first car? I don't mean the first car that you drove, I mean the first car that was yours. When I was in high school, my brother and I shared a car, but my freshman year of college, I inherited a 2000 Buick Century that used to belong to my grandmother. I was rolling like a big shot. It was, it was old, it was brown, it smelled like smoke, and it didn't always work, and I loved that car so much. It was great. It, they don't make them like that anymore, and probably for good reason. But I remember being at my, at my school freshman year of college, and I was getting ready to come back to my parents' house in Wheaton for a long weekend. And I was talking to them on the phone, and while we were talking, they warned me of this uh, thunderstorm that was supposed to come through the route that I was going to take. And I remember talking to the phone about them and, and kind of brushing them aside, saying something like, you know, I've been driving over two years. I think I'll be fine. <laughs> And so we hung up, and, and I started driving, and it was this beautiful day for a road trip. It was sunny and warm, ju just perfect uh, weather for a long drive, and until I turned onto the highway. And I got on the highway, and as soon as I did, the lights went off. And I don't mean my car lights, although that had happened before, and that was a different problem, but I'm talking about the sun was gone. And out of nowhere, this thunderstorm had arrived, and it was crazy. And so suddenly, this perfect and, and, and sunny day turned into this really scary moment in my life, because I'm driving this car, and I don't know if it's going to work and, and get me through this storm, and there are these 18-wheelers trying to drive through, and I can't see 10 feet ahead of me, and I've only been driving for two years. Why didn't my parents say anything? <laughs> So at some point I realized I have to get off the road and, and I'm in the left lane and I'm going like 10 miles an hour and, and I, I, I need to get to the shoulder. And so I kind of just pray and turn and, and pray and turn and keep going and somehow I, I didn't hit anyone and I made it to the side of the road and I pulled over and I stopped and I waited. And I waited and the storm is going and the winds and, and the rain and everything is, is all around me for, for 10 or 15 minutes. I'm just waiting there. And then as, as suddenly as the sun had left, it came right back and the storm was gone and this sense of relief washed over me because the light had arrived. Today we're in the third week of our Advent series, Light of the World, as we've been preparing for Christmas by exploring this first chapter of the book of John and, and looking at this light, Jesus. The last two weeks, we've looked at Jesus being shown as this light of life, this word that has come into the world. And last week, we looked at John the Baptist and his role as this witness to the light, whose purpose it was to, to show people and direct people towards Christ. And throughout all of this, John has been writing with this longing and this desire, the same desire that I had on the side of that road in my beautiful Buick Century a desire for light to shine into the darkness. Today we're gonna to read just four verses together and our goal is to look at what it means to be children of God, to be children of this light. And so let's start together in John chapter one with verse 10. It says this, that he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John touches on so much here, but as we look at these verses in the framework of our Advent series, there are three things that we're going to be focusing on today. The presence of the light, the rejection of the light, and the right of the light. And first we see the presence of this light. 
When I was in high school, my family went on what was at the time the coolest and and biggest vacation we had ever done. We went to Hawaii. We had never done something that big, and, and it was this really great family trip, and we have a lot of fun memories from it. And one day, we were there, and my parents came to my brother and me and, and told us that they had signed us up for a sunrise tour on top of a volcano. And some of you are like, wow, that sounds really awesome. And you are the people I will never go on vacation with. <laughs> sunrise, I, I don't like seeing the sunrise ever, but I'm on vacation. I want to sleep, and I want to go to the beach, and that's it. But I was a kid, and they forced me into it, so I did it. And so 2.30 the next morning, I was uh, rudely awakened, and we got on this bus, and it was dark, and I was tired, and I didn't want to go, but we start going up this volcano. And so it's 10,000 feet in the air. Finally, we get there, and it's dark and foggy, and it's cold in Hawaii, but it's 10,000 feet in the air. So it's cold, and they told us that we couldn't even push each other into the volcano because it wasn't active. So it's like, oh, well, why are we even here then? And, and so I'm just miserable. I'm miserable, and I just want to go home. And so we're all just standing there in the dark like real weird people and and just waiting for the sun to come. And slowly, very gradually, it starts to get a little bit lighter. And, And very slowly and very gradually, it gets a little bit warmer. And then suddenly the sun started to rise and it was one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen. And as the sun rose, this light entered into this space, and we saw just a little bit of the majesty of God's creation. There's a picture I want you to see. This is a professional photograph, but this is the exact view. Uh, They took it in the same place that we were at, and it felt like we were on top of the world. This is a picture that I took, and you can tell me, uh, maybe... (laughs) Tell me which one you like better afterwards. Um, and I'm on the right, as I'm sure you knew. Um, that's my brother on the left, and I know I'm really talented at photography. No, it was incredible, though, how, how everything about that day, about how my attitude, my thoughts, my perspective on the whole trip was transformed by the presence of light, by this presence of the light. And John is writing, and and he's saying the same thing happens here, that the presence of light can be transformational in our lives. The, The arrival of this light that we celebrate during Christmas has come not just over one mountain, but into the entire world. In verse 10, he talks about this. He says that he was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own. And his own people did not receive him. Have you ever considered what role light has in your life? What do you use light for? If you think about it, we are reliant on light for so much of what we do, and yet that was even more so the fact when John was writing these words. He was writing this in a time with no electricity, no flashlights, no cell phones, all the things that we're so used to. And, and it was a time where everything about someone's life revolved around was oriented to the presence of the sun, the presence of light. I think we get a little taste of that around this time of year as the days are getting shorter and we're almost to the shortest day of the year where maybe with your work schedule or your school schedule, you leave the house before the sun rises and you get home after it sets and you're like, I went the whole day without seeing the sun. There's even a medical term, uh, maybe some of you know this, called seasonal affective disorder that talks about how this time of year can affect someone's mood. And one of the treatments to this disorder is called light therapy. And they have these specially designed bright lamps that you can buy. And, and literally all you do is turn it on and you just sit under the light. And it tricks your brain into thinking that you are sitting under the sun. Even in pop culture, many of us will be going to see the new Star Wars movie in a couple of weeks, these movies that the entire premise is revolving around the dark side versus the light. Light is so important. It was God's first declaration that we know of, let there be light. And you can see here on the screen just a couple of examples of of throughout God's word of this light being associated with his word and his presence made with us. But what does light do for you? 
It can guide your path. It can transform your perspective as it did mine that morning. But ultimately, the purpose of light is to show us the way. The purpose of light is to show us the way. And I think that's the key to understanding why John uses this idea, that there was a purpose in God's presence, the purpose of his presence, that that he came not just so that we can celebrate Christmas, but the ultimate reason that we are gathered here today is because he came to the world to show us the way back to the Father, to be our guide and to be our light. Maybe you've experienced how his presence has changed you or transformed you in different areas of your life, and maybe you too can be a witness to that light. But the question that I I bet many of us have asked or are currently asking as we look at ourselves and as we look at those around us is that if all of this is true, if all these things that we're talking about and as we read about and preach about, if all of that is true, then why is it that when I look around, the darkness seems to be doing just fine? Why is it that I struggle so much in my relationships with God and with other people? Why is it that every time I look around, it seems like there's someone in my life who's hurting in a new way? Why does this world seem so broken? Where is this light? These are questions without quick and easy answers, but what I can say today is that there is a promise in God's presence. There is a promise in his presence, and we see it in the life of Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. In the days leading up to Jesus' birth, an angel of God came to Joseph, this this man who had his life all figured out, until his fiancée came to him and, and told him that she was pregnant and he was not the father. Matthew 1 tells us that Joseph was considering leaving her, and then in verse 20 it says this, As he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, behold, The virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is the promise of God's presence. That the presence of Jesus, that that God coming to that which was his own, doing something that we never could have deserved, that can be the proof that we still have hope. It's our hope that even in a situation as as crazy and messed up as Joseph's was, that, that he never expected to have to deal with in his life, that God is still working in those situations, that he hasn't given up on you yet, that the darkness will not have the final say in your life. Our hope is that Emmanuel is not just a word that we sing in Christmas carols, but it is the reality of your life that you do not have to find God because he has already found you. And he is longing to be your light, to show you the way back to the Father, to be your hope that you can rest on. And it's as true for you as it was for me sitting in that car on the side of the highway. The sun is coming, and he can transform your life. The presence of the light has not left you, but there's still a problem, a problem that John recognizes here in this passage as well, the rejection of the light, the rejection of light. A few years ago, I was working as a youth pastor in Indiana, and the first year we were there, we took our students to summer camp. And while we were there, I remember the first night uh, sitting in our cabin with a bunch of guys, and, and I challenged them that night to go 24 hours without any technology. No phones, no tablets, nothing with a screen. And to my surprise, they agreed to this challenge, and so they gave me all of their gear and and put it in my bag, and the 24 hours began. And I knew it was going to be hard. I knew they were going to struggle because if you know a, a, a teenager in your life, 
they love technology, and that's okay. But uh, they, 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 they did it, and they agreed to it, and it's great, and they were doing so well. But there was one student in particular that I knew was going to struggle. His name was Ian, and Ian was one of our youngest students. He was about to enter the seventh grade, and he was this great, funny, really awesome kid that I loved getting to know that was completely addicted to his technology. He came to camp that year with uh, the newest model of iPhone, with a Nintendo Switch that had just come out at the time, and with a camera to make videos for his YouTube channel. He was loaded up, he had it all. But he agreed and he seemed to be doing okay until about five o'clock that day. I was sitting in our cabin, there were a bunch of us getting ready for dinner, and I was just sitting on my bed when I heard the door slam open. And Ian comes sprinting in, and he doesn't look at anyone or make eye contact or say hello to anyone, and he makes a beeline for his bed. And he reaches under his mattress, and he pulls out an iPad (laughs) that I didn't know he had. He snuck it in, (laughs) and he unlocks it, and he starts playing this game. And as he does so, he lets out this sigh of relief like he had been wandering in the desert and had just found water. It was like, oh, finally. And I'm just dying of laughter. This is the funniest thing I've ever seen. And, and he's playing this game, and he yells out to no one in particular, don't tell Joe, <laughs> which Joe knew, because Joe was right there. And so I, I stood up, and I, I start walking over to him, and I, I literally stand right in front of him. We're like a foot apart from each other. And I just say, hey, can I play next? And without pausing, without looking up, without recognizing who was there, he says, no, go away. <laughs> So again, still dying of laughter here. And and then a couple seconds go by, and he realizes who he was talking to. And you would have thought he saw a ghost from how quickly he jumped and ran away. And it was amazing, and I miss Ian so much. (laughs) See, one of the difficult things, though, one of the heartbreaking things that John writes about here happened for the same reason I scared Ian so badly that day. As we look at the history of the people in the Old Testament, there's nothing that they wanted more than a savior to come. They longed for this person, they they cried out for him, they prayed for him, and at some point they became so distracted by this idea that the savior would come as this conquering king. Someone that would come and defeat all of their enemies and it became all that they could focus on. So much so that when Jesus finally did arrive, when the Savior was born, he was right in front of them. And they didn't even look up. And they missed him. We see this in these verses as well. In John chapter 1, verse 10 and 11, it says that he was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not know receive him. This is the problem that John acknowledges here. That the Savior had come, that this light was in the world, and yet two times he was rejected. First, in verse 10, he is rejected by the world. The world did not know him, or or your translation might say the world did not recognize him. And when you think about that, it's actually not that surprising. Why would the world recognize him? They weren't looking for him in the first place. They were worshiping other gods or pursuing other things. It it really makes perfect sense. And yet, what is surprising is what comes next. That his own people did not receive him. The people that were doing exactly what we do now in this time of Advent, they were waiting. They were waiting in expectation. They were waiting for exactly Jesus because he came in a way that they were not expecting, they missed him, and they failed to receive him. It's easy to wonder, to question, how that could ever have happened. And last week we talked about how John the Baptist, this man came for for the sole purpose of pointing people towards this light, to prepare them for their savior. So how could they have failed to receive the one they wanted so much? How could it have happened? And yet, the problem is that as we study what it truly means to receive Christ, as we study this word receive, the truth is that it's something that each one of us is guilty of too. A lot of times when we hear this word receive, the picture that might come into your head is similar to what you might be doing on Christmas morning. 
this exchanging and receiving of a gift where it's kind of this one-time moment and then you're done. And yet when we study this word receive that John uses, it becomes clear that this is not what he's talking about. That it's not this one-time moment, but instead it's this movement. It's this idea of, of connecting yourself and joining yourself and associating yourself with Christ. To take him with you wherever you go. Jesus himself uses this same word called, and the, the Greek word is paralambano. And later in the book of John, Jesus uses this same word in John 14, chapter, or John 14, verse 3. He says this, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will, and then this is our word here, take you to myself. That's the same word as our word receive. And so that's what it means to receive Christ, is to take Christ with you wherever you go. It's more than this one-time moment of acceptance that we call salvation. John is talking about what comes next. To join yourself to someone, to orient your life first and foremost by what Christ means to you. To realize that the choices in our lives can either be choices of reception or choices of rejection. The language used here is so similar to how marriage is talked about several times throughout the Bible. This idea of two people joining together, becoming one. I remember about a month after Judy and I got married, I went to work one day and I realized I forgot to put on my wedding ring. And I kept going to to play with it and it wasn't there and I felt so guilty. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the worst thing I've ever done. And so I went to Judy that day and and I told her what had happened and I was so sorry and please forgive me and it didn't mean anything. I still want to be married. And and she was like, oh yeah, don't worry. I've done that like three times already. (laughs) Which made me feel a little better and a little worse. (laughs) Now, I'm sure we're not alone in forgetting to wear your ring here and there, but imagine if we had given each other these rings on our wedding day. These gifts that symbolize what it means to to love and be committed to each other. And imagine if we had done that, and then after the ceremony, we took them off and we put them in a box, and we never wore them again. You would probably tell us that maybe we don't understand the purpose of the gift. That it's not supposed to be this one-time thing that you wear once and never take with you, but it's supposed to be this sign, this, this symbol of your commitment and your love to show who you are associated with. And John is saying the same thing is true in your relationship with God. That it's so much more than than this one-time moment. And if you think of this salvation moment as the finish line of your faith, you don't understand the purpose of this gift. That to receive Christ is to consider him first every day of your life to grow in this process of what it means to be associated and joined together and connected with him. And to remember that the choices we make can either be choices of reception or of rejection. The last thing that John is gonna show us here is the right of the light, the right of the light. And so far, almost his entire focus in this chapter has been on the work and the, the theology of Christ and of God. And, and there's been a lot of these concepts. And here he switches his focus just a little bit and turns it just a little bit for us here in verse 12. Verse 12 says that, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So what is this right of the light? Verse 12, we see that John kind of turns this passage a little bit from this really difficult rejection of God, and he uses this beautiful phrase that for all who received him and believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. And that word right is a word that often translates to power or authority. It's this idea that we have been given this privilege from someone else. That we have, been, that we have become children of God only through the Son of God. That God does not see you just as a creation of his or not just a slave to him, but he sees you as a child. That you are a part of his family. 
The truth is that when we become a part of a new family, that there are certain things you inherit based on whose child you are. Maybe you've been told by people certain things about you that they also see in your parents, and maybe that kind of drives you crazy sometimes. Or, or maybe in your own kids, there are things that you see, and you're like, wow, that is all me. Or, wow, that is all her. Ooh. <laughs> we inherit certain things based on whose child we are. I remember when I was younger, I saw a picture of my dad when he was a kid. And I was 100% convinced that someone had taken a picture of my brother with a really bad camera. That's how much they looked alike. You inherit certain things based on whose child you are. And the same thing happens when we are given this authority, when we are given this right to become children of God. And John gives us three examples of some of what our inheritance is. We've inherited the right to believe, to have this gift of faith, to believe that the name of Jesus has power in our lives and in the world. We've inherited the right to be born, to be given new life, not just to be born of men, but of God. And we have inherited the right to become, to be adopted into a family that allows you to grow into who you've been created to be. There's something so powerful about this idea and this choice of adoption. And if that's been part of your story or your family story or someone that you care about, you know that power well. That power of saying, I'm making the choice. I'm choosing you to be my family now and forever. The Apostle Paul talks about this idea of adoption as well. In Romans chapter 8, verse 15, he says this, The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. If we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Judy and I don't have children. We do have the millennial version of a child, which is a dog that we treat like a child. This is a little family picture of us. That's Wrigley Scavato in the middle there, middle name field. And um, we adopted Wrigley when we were living in Indianapolis. And we got him from a shelter there, and the, the shelter found him living on the streets, and they tried to contact his owner, but for whatever reason, the owner never responded. And so we don't know anything about whoever that person was, and yet getting to know Wrigley as we adopted him, as we joined him to our family, there are things that we learned about his old family, things that he had inherited from them. Wrigley was comfortable around my wife from, from day one. He, he loved her immediately, and yet for weeks after we added him to our family, anytime I got too close to him or, or moved too quickly or raised my hand by him, he would shrink back in fear. He would become very timid and afraid. Now, we don't know, we, we, we joke that, that sometimes that he's prejudiced against men, but, but we don't know exactly what happened, but what we do know is that fear always has a starting point. And that there's something that he inherited from his family that led to that fear. But Wrigley has a new family now. And as we got to know him and as he got to know us as much as a dog can, he, he started to get more comfortable around me. And, and as he did so, his personality started to come out too. No longer was he timid and afraid, but instead loving and excited about every part of life, sometimes a little bit too much for my taste. <laughs> but when he discovered who he belonged to, that he was a part of this family who loved him and wanted the best for him, it's like he became a new creation. Friends, the same thing is true for us. When you know who you belong to, when you realize what it truly means to be a child of God, everything can change in your life. When you realize what it means to have been adopted by a father who loves you more than you could possibly understand, it means that you have been given this opportunity to be this new creation, to grow in ways that you never have before. It means that you've 
that, that he has made you a co-heir with Christ. And that means that you have been inherited, that you have been given the most powerful and valuable thing that there could possibly be, a relationship with your heavenly Father, a knowledge of eternity with him. It means that you have the right, the authority, to not let the things of this world overcome you, because he has overcome the world. And it means that no matter where you're coming from today, no matter your life situation, no matter how much darkness it might seem to be overwhelming you with, that your light is here. And he is not going anywhere. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the truth in your word that you are the light of the world and that you are here in our lives. God, that we have this opportunity to receive you and to become children of God. We have inherited these rights, these authorities to call ourselves children, to allow ourselves to hold on to that hope. God, I pray that you would remind each one of us what it means to receive you today and every day of our lives. We pray all of this in your name. Amen.